Hello and welcome back to Tales from Africa. This week we continue on with Jock of the Bushveld, starting with the chapter 1, Into the Bushveld. Distant hills are always green, and the gold further on. That is a law of nature, human nature, which is quite superior to facts, and thus the world moves on. So, from the Lindenburg goldfields, prospectors, humping their swags, or driving their small-packed donkeys, spread a field, and transport riders with their long spans and rumbling wagons followed, cutting a wider track where traders with winding strings of carriers had already ventured on. But the hunters had gone first. There were great hunters whose names are known, and others as great who missed the accident of fame, and after them hunters who traded and traders who hunted, and so too with prospectors, diggers, transport riders and all. Between the gold fields and the nearest port lay the bushfeld, and game enough for all to live on, Thus, all were hunters of a sort, but the great hunters, the hunters of big game, were apart. We were the smaller fry, there to admire and imitate. Trophies carried back with pride, or by force of habit, lay scattered about, neglected and forgotten, round the outspans and the tents of lone prospectors, the cabins of diggers, and the grass wayside shanties of the tra traders. How many a record head must have gone then! when none had thought of time or means to save them. Horns and skins lay in jumbled heaps in the yards or shed of the big trading stores. The splendid horns of the kudu and sable and a score of others only less beautiful could be seen nailed up in crude adornment of the roughest walls, and were nailed up and then unnoticed and unforgotten and forgotten. And yet, not quite. For though... To, for though to the older hands they were of no further interest, to the newcomer they spoke of something yet to see, and something to be done, and the sight set him dreaming of the time when he too would go a-hunting and bring his trophies home. Perched on the edge of the berg, we overlooked the wonder world of the bushfold, where the big game roamed in thousands, and the wildest tales were true. Living on the fringe of a hunter's paradise, most of us were drawn into it from time to time for shorter or longer spells as opportunity and our circumstances allowed. And little by little, one got to know the names, appearances and habits of the many kinds of games below. Long talk in the quiet nights up there under wagons, in grass shelters in the woods, or in the wattle and daub shanties of the diggers, where men passed to and fro and swapped lies, as the polite phrase went, were our night's entertainments. When younger hands might learn much that was useful and true, and more than that was neither. It was a school of grown-up schoolboys, no doubt a hard one, but it had its playground side, and it was the habit of the school to drop on to any breach of the unwritten laws, to rub in with remorseless good humour the mistakes that were made, and to play upon credulity with a shamelessness and nerve quite paralysing to the judgment of the inexperienced. Yet, with it all, there was a kind, kind kindliness and quick instinct of fair dues with tempered, uh, with which tempered the wind, and, in the main, gave no one more than was good for him. There the new boy had to run, the gauntlet, and, if without a watchful instinct or friendly hint, there was nothing to watch warn him of it. When Faulkner, dragged to the piano, protested that he remembered nothing but a mere morceau, he was not conscious of transgression, but a delighted audience caught up the word, and thenceforth he was known only as Encore Harry, the sailor, having explained that morceau was a recognised variant. Johnny come lately's got to learn was how to be an adequate reason for letting many a beginner buy his experience, while those who had been through it all watched him stum stumble into the well-known pitfalls. It would no doubt have been a much more comfortable arrangement all around had there been a polite ignoring of each other's blunders and absurdities, but that is not the way of schools where the spirit of fun plays its usual part, and, after all, the lesson well rubbed in is well remembered. The newest sayer, primed by us with towers of sable antelope, rounded Mac Mac Camp, shot old Jim Hill's only goat, and had to leave the carcass with a note of explanation, Jim being out when he called. What he heard from us when he returned, all prickly with remorse and shame, was a liberal education. But what he remembers best is Jim's note addressed that evening in our, to our camp. Boys, Jim Hill requests your company to dinner tomorrow, Sunday. 
mutton. As the summer spent itself and whispers spread around of new strikes further on, a spirit of restlessness touched a touch and of new str- of trek fever came upon us, and each cast about which way to try his luck. Our camp was a summer headquarters of two transport riders, and when many months of hard work, timber cutting on the berg, contracting for the companies, pole slipping in the bush, and other things gave up us at last a rise, it seemed the natural thing to put it all into wagons and oxen and go transport riding too. The charm of a life of freedom and complete independence, a life in which a man goes as and where he lists and carries his home with him, is great indeed. But great too was the fact that hunting would go with it. How the little things that mark a new departure stamp themselves indelibly on the memory. A flower in the hedgerow where the roads divide will mark the spot in one's mind forever, and yet a million more before and after, and all as beautiful are past unseen. In memory it is all as fresh, bright, and glorious as ever, only the years have gone. The start, the trek along the plateau, the crystal streams, the ferns in the trees, the cool, pure air, and through and over all, the quiet, intoxicating sense of freedom. Then came the long, slow climb to Spitzkop, where the berg is highest, and where our descent began. For there, what with Africa's contrariness, the highest parts banked up and buttressed by gigantic spurs are most accessible from below. While the lower edges of the plateau are cut off sheer like walls of some great fortress, there, near Spitzkop, we looked down upon the promised land. There stood out upon the outmost edge as a diver on his board and paused and looked and breathed before he took the plunge. It is well to pitch one's expectations low and so stave off disappointments, but counsels of perfection are wasted on the young, and when accident combines with the hopefulness of youth to lay the colours on in all their gorgeous, what chance has wisdom? See here, young fellow, said wisdom, don't go fool yourself with tom- tomful notions about lions and tigers waiting behind every bush. You won't see one in twelve months, most likely you won't see a buck for a week, you don't know what to do, what to wear, how to walk, how to look, or what to look for, and you'll make as much noise as a traction engine. This ain't open country, it's bush. They can see in here and you can't, and it's a big game, you ain't seen any for a long while yet, so don't go fool yourself. Excellent. But fortune is, a, is a, in a sportive mood, ordained at the very first thing we saw as we outspanned at Sordison's on the very first day in the bushveld was the fresh skin of a lion stretched out to dry. What would the counsels of Solomon himself have weighed against that wet skin? Wisdom scratched his head and starred. Well, I am, I am completely sugared. Of course it was a fluke. No lions had been seen in the locality for several years, but the beginner, filled with all the wildest expectations, took no heed of that. If the wish be fathered to the thought, then surely fact may well beget conviction. It was so in this case, at any rate, and thus not all the cold assurance of wisdom could banish victims of big game, visions of big game as plentiful as partridges. A party had set out upon a tiger hunt to clear out one of those marauders who used to hunt the cliffs of the berg and make descents upon the kaffir herds of goat and sheep. But there was a special interest in this particular tiger, for he had killed one of the white hunters in the last attempt to get him a few weeks before. Starting from the store, the party of men and boys worked their way towards the cliff, and the possibility of coming across a lion never entered their heads. No notice was taken of a smaller game put up from time to time as they moved carelessly along. A rustle on the left of the line was ignored, and Bill Saunderson was as surprised as Bill could ever, ever could be to see a lion facing him at something like six or seven yards. The lion, with head laid level and tail flicking ominously, half crouched for its spring. Bill's bullet glanced along the scowl, peeling off the skin. It was a bad shot, he said afterwards in answer to the beginner's breathless questions. He wasn't hurt, just sank a little like a pointer when you check him, but before he steadied up again and I took for the nose and got him. You see, he added thoughtfully, a lion's got no forehead, it's all here. That was about all he had to say. 
but little store as he may have set it, the tip was never forgotten, and it proved of much value to at least one of our party years afterwards. To this day, the picture of a lion brings up that scene, the crouching beast faced by a man with a long brown beard, solemn face and clear unfaltering eyes, the swift yet quiet action of reloading, and a second shot an inch or so lower, because a lion's got no forehead, it's all here. The shooting of a lion, fair and square and face to face, was the blue riband of the bush, and no detail would have seemed so superfluous. Suplu- 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 but Bill, whose eye nothing could escape, had, like many great hunters, a laggard tongue. Only now and then a look of grave amusement lighted up his face to show he recognized the hungry enthusiasm and, and his own inability to satisfy it. The skin with the grey stripe along the nose and the broken skull was handled and looked at many times, and the story was pumped from every kaffir, all voluble and eager, but none eyewitnesses. Bob, the sociable and more communicative, who have been who has had been nearest his brother, was asked a hundred questions, but all he had to say was that the grass was too long for him to see what happened. He reckoned that it was a pretty near thing after the first shot. Bill's all right. To me it was an absurd and tiresome affection to show interest in any other topic, and when, during that evening, conversation strayed to other subjects, it seemed waste of time and priceless opportunity. Bob responded good, uh, good natu- naturally to many crude attempts to head them back to the entra- entrancing theme, but the professional interest in rates, loads, rivers, roads, disease and drought and fly was strong in the older transport riders, as it should have been, but for the time at least was not in me. If diplomacy failed, however, luck was not all out. For when all the pet subjects of the road had been thrashed out and it was about time to turn in, a stray question brought the reward of patience. Have you heard of Jim Reach Durbin all right? Yes, safely shipped. You got someone to take him right through? No, a Dutchman took him to Lindenburg, and I, and I got Tom Hartley going back empty to take him along from there. What about feeding? I sent some goats, said Bob, smiling for a moment at some passing thought, and then went on. Tom said he had he had an old span that wouldn't mind it. We loaded him up at Parker's, and I cleared out before he got the cattle up. But they tell me there was a gay jamboree when it came to in spanning, and as soon as they got up to the other wagons and the young bullocks winded Jim, they started off with their towels up, a rigorous stampede, four loopers and drivers yelling there like mad, all the loose things shaking about off the, off the wagons, and Tom, nearly in a fit from running, shouting and swearing. Judging by the laughter, there was only one person present who did not understand the joke, and I had to ask, with some misgivings, who was this Jim who needed no so much care and feeding and caused such a scare? There was another burst of laughter as they guessed my thoughts, and it was Bob who answered me. Only a lion, lad, not a wild man or lunatic, only a young lion, sold him to the zoo and had to deliver him to Durban. Well, you fairly took me in with the name. Ah, Jim, oh, that's my his, his pet name. His real name is Dabolamanzi. Jim, my hunting boy, caught him, so he called him Jim out of a compliment, he added with a grin. But Jim called him Double Lamanzi out of, also out of a compliment, and I think that was a pretty good for Nua. You see, said Bob, for the benefit of those who were not up in local history, Double Lamanzi, the big fighter general in the Zulu War, was Jim's own chief and leader, and the name means the one who conquers the waters. Then one of the others exclaimed, Oh, of course, that's how you got him, isn't it? Caught him in a river. Tell us what happened, Bob. What's the truth of it? It seemed a bit steep as I heard it. Well, it's really simple enough. We came right on to the lioness waiting for us, and I got her, and then there were three. Sh- then there were shouts from the boys, and I saw a couple of cubs, pretty well grown, making off in the grass. This boy, Jim, legged after one of them, a cub about as big as, new- as a Newfoundland dog, not so high, but longer, I followed as fast as I could, but he was a big Zulu and went like a buck, yelling mad all the time. We were in the bend of one of the long pools down near the Komate, and when I got through the reeds, the cub was at the water's edge facing Jim, and Jim was dancing around, heading it off with only one light stick. As soon as, I, as, soon as it saw us coming, the cub took to the water, and Jim after it. 
It was as good as a play. Jim swam up behind and putting his hand on its head, dumped it right under. The cub turned as it came up and struck out at him viciously, but he went back. He was back out of reach. When it turned again to Jim, ducked it again, and it went on like that six or eight times till the thing was half drowned and had no more fight in it. Then Jim got hold of it by the towel and swam back to us, still shouting and quite mad with excitement. Of course, added Bob, with a wag of his head. You can say it was only a cub, but it takes a good man to go up naked and tackle a thing like that with teeth and claws to cut you into ribbons. Was Jim here today? I asked, as soon as there was an opening. Bob shook his head with a kindly, regretful smile. No, Sonny, not here. You'd have heard him. Jim's gone. I had to sack him. A real fine nigger, but a terror to drink and always in trouble. He fairly wore me right out. We were generally a party of a half dozen. The owners of the four wagons, a couple of friends trading with Delagoa, a man from Swaziland, and, just then, an old Yankee hunter prospector. It was our holiday time before the hard work of loads would commence, and we dawdled along feeding up the cattle and taking it easy ourselves. It was too early for loads in the bay, so we moved slowly and hunted on the way, sometimes camping for several days in places where grass and water were good, and that lion's skin was the cause of many disappointments to me. Never a bush or ant heap, never a donga or a patch of reeds, did I pass for many days after that without the conviction that something was lurking there. Game there was in plenty, no doubt, but it did not come my way. Days went by with once or twice the sight of some small buck just as it disappeared, and many times the noise of other things in the bush or the sound of galloping feet. Other Others brought the contributions to the pot daily, and there seemed to be no reason in the world why I alone should fail. No reason except sheer bad luck. It is difficult to believe you have made mistakes when you do not know enough to recognise them, and have no idea of the extent of your own ignorance. And then bad luck is such an easy and such a flattering explanation. If I did not go so far on the easy road of excuse-making as to put all the failures down to bad luck, perhaps some someone else deserves the credit. One evening, as we were lounging around the campfire, Robbie, failing to find a soft spot for his head on a thorn log, got up reluctantly to fetch his blankets, exclaiming with a mock tragic air, The time is out of joint, O oh, cursed spite, that ever I was born to set it right. We knew Robbie's ways. There was some t- there were times when he would spout heroics suggested by some passing trifle, his own face a marvel of solemnity the whole time, and only the amused expression in his spectral uh, grey eyes to show he was poking fun at himself. An indulgent smile, a chuckle, and the genial comment, silly ass, came from different quarters, for Robbie was a favourite. Only old Rocky maintained his usual gravity. As Robbie settled down again in comfort, the old man remarked in level, thoughtful tones, I reckon the fellow as said that was a waster, he chuckled. At. There was a short pause in which I, in my ignorance, began to wonder if it was possible that Rocky did not know the source, or did he not take the quotation seriously. Then Robbie answered a mild protest. It was a gentleman of the name of Hamlet who said it. Well, you can bet, me, me, you can bet he was no good anyhow, Rocky drawled out. Just my luck is a waster's motto. They do say he was mad, Robbie replied, as his face twitched with a pull your leg expression. But he got off a, a lot of first class things all the same, some of the best things ever said. I dare say they mostly can, but a man as sits down and blames his luck is no good anyhow. He's got no sand, and he's got no sense and got no honesty. It ain't the time's wrong. And then the time's wrong, it's the man. And then the job's too big, it's the man's too little. You don't believe in luck at all, Rocky, I ventured to put in. I don't say there does no, no thing as luck, good and bad, but it ain't the explanation of success and failure, not by a long way. No, sir, luck just the thing any man like to believe is the reason for his failure and another fellow's success. But it ain't so. When another man pulls off what you don't, the first thing you got to believe is it's your own fault, and the last thing it's his luck. And you just got to wait in and find out what you went wrong and put it right. Thought any ex- excuses and any explanations. But Rocky, explanations aren't always excuses, and sometimes you really have to give it to them. 
Sonny, you can reckon it dead sure there's something wrong, but a thing that don't explain itself, and and one explanation is as bad as two mistakes, it don't fool anybody worth speaking of except yourself. You find the remedy you you worth speak, you can leave the others folk put up the excuses. I was beaten. It was no use going on, for I knew he was right. I suppose the other fellows also knew whom he was getting at, but they said nothing. And the subject seemed to have dropped, when Rocky, harking back to Robbie's quotation, said, with a ghost of a smile, I reckon if that sharp o' your head too, keep the camp and meet, we go pretty nigh hungry. But it seemed a good it seemed a good deal to give up all at once, the bad luck, the excuses and explanations, and the comfort they afforded. And I could not help thinking of that wretched, wrong-headed stembuck that had actually allowed me to pass it, and then cantered away behind me. Rocky, known, liked, and respected by all, yet intimate with none, was going north, even to the Zambezi. It was whispered, but no one knew where or why. He was going off alone with two packed donkeys, and not even a boy for company, on a trip of many hundreds of miles in an indefinite duration. No doubt he had an idea to work out, Perhaps a report of some trader or hunter, or even native, it was his pole star. Most certainly he had a plan, but what it was, no living soul would know. That was the way of his kind. With them there was no limit in time or distance, no hint of purpose or direction, no home, no address, no people. Perhaps a partner somewhere, or a chum, as silent as themselves, who would hear some day if there was anything to tell. Rocky had worked near our camp on the berg. I had known him to nod too, and when we met again at one of the early outspans in the bush and offered a lift for him and his packs, he accepted and joined us. It had been still a bit early to attempt the crossings, crossing the rivers with pack donkeys. It may be that the lift saved his donkey something of the roughest roads and in the early stages, or it may be that we served as a useful screen for his motiva- movements, making it diff- difficult for anyone else to follow his line and watch him. Anyway, he joined us in the way of those days, that is, we travelled together, and as a rule, we grubbed together. But each cooked for himself and used his own stores, and in principle we maintained our separate establishments. The bag alone was common, each man brought what game he got and threw it into the common stock. The secret of agreement in the Vald is complete independence. Points of contact are points of friction, nowhere more so and the safest plan is each man his own outfit, and each free to feed or sleep or trick as and when he chooses. I have known partners and friends who would, from time to time, move a trick apart, or a day apart, and always camp apart when they rejoined, and so remain friends. Rocky, in full, Rocky Mountain Jack, had another name, but it was known to few besides the mining commissioner's clerk who registered his licenses from time to time. And the rocky ease why I was raised is about the only remark having deliberate reference to his personal history, which he, which he was known to have made, but it was enough on which to found the name by which we knew him. What struck me first about him was a long Colt's revolver carried out on his hip, and for two days this gun, as he called it, conjured up visions of poker flat and roaring camp, jank hamlin and yubbabo of terish memory. And then the inevitable question got itself asked. Did you ever shoot a man, Rocky? No, Sonny, he drawled gently. Neither had to use it yet. It looks very old. Uh, how, how have you had it long? Just about thirty years, I reckon. Oh, seems a long time to carry a thing without using it. Well, he answered absently. It's, uh, it's a thing you don't want often, but when you do, you want it on bad. Rocky seemed to have stepped into our life out of the pages of Brett Harty. For me, the glamour of romance was cast by the master's spell over all that world, and no doubt helped to make old Rocky something of a hero in the eyes of youth. But such help was of small account, for the cardinal fact was Rocky himself. He was a man. There did not seem to be any non-region of the earth where prospectors roam that he had not sampled, and yet whilst gleaning something from every land, His native flavour clung to him unchanged. He was silent by habit and impossible to draw, not helpful to those who looked for shortcuts, yet kindly impatient with those who meant to try. He was not to be exploited and had an illuminating instinct for what was not genuine. He had no use for short weight and showed it. I used to watch him in the circle around the fire at nights, 
his face grave, weather stained and wrinkled, with clear grey eyes and long brown beard slightly grizzled then. Watch and wonder why Rocky, experienced, wise and steadfast, should, at sixty, be seeking still. Were the prizes so few in this prospector's life, or was there something wanting in him too? Why had he not achieved success? It was not so clear that ideals differ. Rocky's ideal was the life, not the escape from it. There was something, sentiment, imagination, poetry, call it what you will, that sh sh could make common sense seem to him common indeed and cheap. To follow in a new rush, to reap where another had sown, had no charm for him. It may be that an inborn pride disliked it, but it seems more likely that it was sim that it simply did not attract him. And if, as in the end I thought, Rocky had taken the world as it is and backed himself against it, living up to his ideal, playing a lone hand, and playing it fair in all conditions, treading the unbeaten tracks, finding his triumph in his work, always moving on and contented so to the end, the crown, he was a man, then surely Rocky ha Rocky's had achieved success. That is Rocky as remembered now, a bit idealised, perhaps so, but who can say, in truth he had his sides and the defects of his qualities like everyone else, and it was not everyone who made a hero of him. Many, many left him respectively alone, and some of their feelings came to me the first time I was with him, when a stupid chatter, chatterer talked and asked too much. He was not surely or tacturin, but I felt frozen by a calm, deadly unresponsiveness which anything with blood and brain should have shrunk under. The dull, monotonous, the ominous draw, the steady something in his clear, calm eyes, which I cannot define, gave an almost corrosive effect to innocent words and a voice of lazy gentleness. What's the best thing to do following up a wounded buffalo was the question. The question sprung briskly as only a yapper puts them, and the answers came reluctant drops from a filter. Get out. Yes, but if there isn't any time. Say your prayers. No, seriously, what's the best way of tackling one? If you want to know, there's only one way. Keep cool and shoot straight. Oh, of course, if you can. And if you can't, he added in full colour tones, they stay right home. Rocky had no fancy notions. He hunted for meat and got it as soon as possible. He was seldom out long and really indeed came back empty-handed. I had already learned not to be too ready with questions. It was better so, it was better so Rocky put it, to keep your eyes open and your mouth shut. But the results at first hardly seemed to justify the process. At the end of the week of failures and disappointments, all I knew was that I knew nothing. A very notable advance, it is true, but one quite difficult to appreciate. Thus it came to me in the light of, of a distinction when one evening, after a rueful confession or blundering made to the party in general, Rocky passed a brief but not unfriendly glance over me and said, On the, the born fools stay fools. You get to learn by and by. You ain't always yapping. It was not an extravagant po compliment, but failure and helplessness act on conceit like water on a starch collar. Mine was limp by that time, and I was grateful for little things. Most grateful when next morning, as we were discussing our several ways, he turned to me and asked gently, Come in along, boy. Surprise and gratitude must have produced the touch of eff effusiveness which jarred on him. For, to the eager explanation, e exclamation and thanks, he made no answer, just moved on, leaving me to follow. In his scheme of life, there was no call to slop over. There was a quiet, unhesitating sureness and a definiteness of purpose around old Rocky's movements which immediately inspired confidence. We had not been gone many minutes before I began to have visions of exciting chases and glorious endings, and as we walked silently along, they took possession of me so completely that I failed to notice the difference between his methods and mine. Presently, brimful of excitement and hope, I asked cheerily what he thought we would get. The old man stomped in with a gentle graveness of look and a voice from which all trace of tartness or sarcasm was banished, said, See, Sonny, if you've been oyster going round like a dog with a tin, and any wonder you've seen nothing. you got to walk soft and keep your head shut. In reply to my apology, he said that there was no bell and curtain in this year play. you got to be there with a tin. Rocky knew better than I did the extent of his good nature. He knew that in all probability it meant to waste the day, for with the best will in the world, the beginner is almost certain to spoil sport. 
It looks so simple and easy when you only have read about it or heard others talk, but there are pitfalls at every step. When and what seemed to me perfectly still air, Rocky took a pinch of dust and let it drop, and afterwards wet one figure and held it up to feel which side cooled. It was not difficult to know what he was that he was trying the wind, but when he changed direction and suddenly for no apparent reason, or when he stopped after a glance at the ground, slackened his frame, lost all interest in sport, wind and surroundings, and addressed a remark to me in ordinary tones, I was hopelessly at sea. His manner showed that some possibility was disposed of and some idea abandoned. Once he said, Right, Buck, heard us, I reckon, Then and then turned off at a right angle. But a, a little later on he pointed to another spur and indefinitely dropping the word kudu, and continued straight on. To me, that the two spores seemed equally fresh. He saw how perhaps the whole day's difference between them. That the red buck scared by us had gone ahead and was keenly on the watch for us, and therefore not worth following, and that the kudu was on the move and had simply struck across our line and therefore was not to be overtaken, were conclusions he drew without hesitation. I only saw spore and began to palpitate with thoughts of bagging a kudu bull. We had been out perhaps an hour, and by unceasing watchfulness I had learnt many things. They were about as well learnt, and as useful as a sentence in a foreign language got off by heart, but to me they seemed the essentials and the fundamentals of hunting. I was feeling very pleased with myself and confident of the result. The stumbling over stones and stumps had ceased, and there were no more catching in the thorns, crouching on bare, gritty places, thinking on rocks or crackling on dried twigs. And as we moved on in silence, the visions of Kudu and other big game became very real. There was nothing to hinder them. To, as, to do as Rocky did had become mechanically easy. A glance in his direction every now and then was enough. There was time and temptation to look about, and still perhaps to be the first to spot the game. It was after talking one such, taking one such casual glance around that I suddenly missed Rocky. A moment later I saw him moving forward, fast but silently, under cover of an ant heap, stooping low and signing to me with one hand behind his back. What with a horrible feeling of having failed him, I made a hurry step sideways to get into line behind him and the ant heap, and I stepped onto a pile of dry, crackly sticks. Rocky stood up quiet, quietly and waited. Well, I wished the earth would open and swallow me. When I got up a breast, he half turned and looked, over, looked me over with eyes, slightly narrowed and a faint but ominous smile on one side of his mouth, and drawled out gently. You ought to have brought some firecrackers. If only he had sworn at me, I would have been, it would have been endurable. We moved on again, and this time I had eyes for nothing but Rocky's back, and we had to put my foot next. It was not very long before he checked in mid-stride, and I stood rigid as a pointer, Peering intently over his shoulder in the direction in which he looked, I could see nothing. The bush which was very open, and yet, even with his raised rifle to guide me, I could not, for the life of me, see what he was aiming at. Then the shot rang out, and a drugger toppled over, kicking in the grass not a hundred yards away. The remembrance of certain things still makes me feel uncomfortable. The yell of delight I let out as the buck fell, the wild dash forward which died away to stop dead as I realised that Rocky himself had not moved. The sight of him, as I looked back, calmly reloading in the silence. To me it was an event, to him his work. But these things were forgotten when, then, lost behind the everlasting puzzle. How was it possible I had not seen the buck until it fell? Rocky must have known what was worrying me, for, after we had picked up the buck, he remarked without any preliminary, it ain't easy in this bush to pick up what don't move, and it ain't hardly possible to find what you don't know. Game, you mean, I asked, somewhat puzzled. This one was for feeding, he answered after a nod in reply. I saw his head to go up to listen, but when they don't move and you just don't know what they look like, you can most walk atop them. You got to kind of shape them in your eye, and when you got that fix, you can pick them up anywhere. It cost Rocky an effort to volunteer anything, there, was, there were others ready to talk and advise, but there were, they were no help. It was Rocky himself who once said that, The man who's always offering his advice for nothing, asking about as much as worth. He seemed to run dry of words like an overdrawn well. For several days he took no further notice of me, apparently having forgotten my existence or repented his good nature. 
Once again, when in reply to a question, I, I was owning up to the hopes and chances and failures of the day. I caught his attentive look, turned on me, and was conscious of it, and a little apprehensive. For the rest of the evening, nothing happened. The following evening, however, it came out. I had felt that the look meant something, and that sooner or later I would catch it. It was characteristic of him that he would always wait, and I never felt satis quite safe with him, never comfortably sure that something was not being saved up for me, for some mistake perhaps days old. He was not to be hurried, nor was he to be put off, and nobody ever interrupted him or headed him off. His quiet voice never was never raised, and the lazy gentleness never disturbed. He seemed to know exactly what he wanted to say, and to have opening and attention waiting for him. I suppose it was partly because he spoke so seldom that there was something else too, the something that was just Rocky himself, although the talk appeared the result of accident, an instinct told me from the start that it was not really so. It was Rocky's slow and considered way. The only dog with fuss licking a cut on his shoulder, the result of an unauthorised rush at, at her wounded buck, and after an examination of her wound, we had wandered over the account of how she had got it, and so on discussing the dog herself. Rocky sat in silence, smoking and looking into the fire, and the little discussion was closed by someone saying, She's not good for a hunting dog, too plucky. It was then I saw Rocky's eyes turn slowly on the last speaker. He looked at him thoughtfully for a good minute, and remarked quietly, There ain't no thing as too plucky. And with that he stopped, almost as if inviting contradiction. Whether he wanted a reply or not, one cannot say. Anyway, he got, his, he got none. No one took Rocky on unnecessarily, and at his leisure he resumed. There's brave men in the fools, as ye can get some that's both, but there's a whole heap that ain't, and it's just the same with dogs. She's no thought fool, but she ain't been taught. That's what's the matter with her. Men has got to learn, dogs too. Men aren't born equal, no more dogs. One is born better than the other, more brains, more heart. But I ain't yet heard of the man born of knowledge or experience. That's what they got to learn, men and dogs. The born fools got to do fool's work all the time, but the others learn, and the brave man of brains got a big pool. He don't got shook up, just keeps on thinking out his job right along, while the other fellows worrying about his hide. And dogs is the same. Rocky's eyes, forever grave and thoughtful, rested on the fire, and the remarks that came from the other men passed unnoticed, but they served to keep the subject alive. Presently, he went on again, opening with an observation that caused me to move uneasily before there was time to think why. Boys is as much like pups. You've got to help them some, but not too much, and not too soon. they got to learn themselves, I reckon, if a man ever made a mistake, he's never had a good lesson. If you don't pay for a thing, you don't know what it's worth, and mistakes is part of the price of knowledge, the other part is work. Mistakes is the part you don't like paying, and that's why you remember it. You save a boy from making mistakes, and if he's good at stuff in him, most likely you spoil it. But he don't know anything properly because he don't think. And if he don't think because you saved him the trouble, and he's never learned how. He don't know the meaning of consequences and risks because you keep him off him. And by and by he gets to believe it's born in him to go right, and knows everything and can't go wrong. And if things don't pan out in the end, he reckons it's just bad luck. No, sir. If he's got to swim, you you let him know right there that the water's deep and there's and no one to hold him up. And if he don't wade in and land, it's going to be his funeral. My eyes were in Rocky, were all for Rocky, but he was not looking my way. And when the next remark came, and my heart jumped, and my hands and feet moved on their own accord, his face was turned quite away from me towards the man on his left. And it's just the same. It's the hunting. It looks so blamed easy, he reckons, that it don't need any teaching. But let him try. Leave him run on his till with his boots is walked off, and he's like to sit down and cry if he weren't ashamed to. Let him know every particular sort of blame fool he could make of himself, and then he's fit to teach, because he'll listen and watch and learn and say thank you for it. Most, mostly you've got to make a fool of yourself once or twice to know what, it's, what it feels like and how to avoid it. Best to it young, it teaches a boy, but it kind of breaks a man up. 
I kept my eyes on Rocky, avoiding the others, fearing that her look or word might tempt some one to rub it in, and it was a relief when the old man naturally and easily picked up his original point, turning another look on Jess and said, You got you got to begin on the pup. It ain't her fault, it's yours. She's full of the right stuff, but she's got to show to learn. Dogs is all different, good and bad, just like men. Some learns quick, some never learn. But that aren't easy to that ain't to any too plucky. He tossed the coin of green wood into the heart of the fire and watched it spurt on smoke, and after quite a long pause added There's time when a dog got to see it through and be killed. It's his duty. Same as a man's, I've seen it done. The last words were added with a narrowing of his eyes and a curious softening of his voice, as of personal affection or regret. Others noticed it too, and in reply to a question as to how it happened, Rocky explained in a few words that a wounded buffalo had weighed, laid, and tossed the man over its back, and as it turned again to gore him, the dog rushed in between fighting it all for time and eventually fastening on to the nose where the buffalo still pushed on. The check enabled the man to reach his gun and shoot the buffalo, but the dog was trampled to death. Were you? Someone began. And then at the look in Rocky's face, hesitated. Rocky, staring into the fire, answered, It was my dog. Long after the other men were asleep, I lay in my blankets, watching the tricks of light and shadow played by the fire, as fitfully it flamed or died away. It showed the long prostrate figures of the others as they slept full stretch on their backs, wrapped in dark blankets. The wagons touched with unwanted colours by the flames and softened to ghostly shadows when they died. The oxen sleeping contently at their yokes, Rocky's two donkeys, steep black and grey, tethered under a thorn tree now and then, a long ear moving slowly to some distant sound and dropping back again, satisfied. I could not sleep, but Rocky was sleeping like a babe. He, gaunt and spear, six foot two, he must have stood, weather beaten and old, with the long, solitary trip before him and sixty, sixty odd years of life behind. He slept when he laid his head down and was wide awake and rested when he raised it. He who had been through it all slept, but I, who had only listened, was haunted, bewitched, possessed by racing thoughts, and on all account of four words and the way he said them, it was my dog. It was still dark, with a faint promise of saffron in the east, when I found a hand on my shoulder and heard Rocky's voice saying, Come in along, sonny. One of the drivers raised his head to look at us as we passed, and then caught to his full looper to turn the cattle loose to graze and drop back to sleep. We left them loose, we, we left them and set, so and settled out into the pure, clear morning, but all the world was still. While well, the air, cold and subtly stimulating, put a spring into the step and an extra beat or two into the pulse, fairly rinsing lungs and eyes and brain. What is there to tell of that day? Why? Nothing. Really nothing, except that it was a happy day. A day of little things that all went well, and so it came to look like the birthday of hunting. What did it matter to me that we were soaked through in ten minutes, for the dew weighed down the heavy... The heavy topped grass, which with clusters of crystal drops that looked like diamond sprays, it was all too beautiful for words, and so it should be in spring time of youth. Rocky was different that day. He showed me things, reading the open book of nature that I could not understand. He pointed out the spores going to and from the drinking place and named the various animals, showing me one more deeply indented than the rest and murmuring. Scared, I guess. Pointed to where it had dashed off out of the regular tract. Picked out the big splayed pad of the hyena sneaking around under cover. Stopped quietly in his stride to point where a hare was sitting up cleaning itself, not ten yards off. Stopped again at the sound of a clear, almost met metallic clink and pointed to a little sandy gully in front of us, down which presently came thirty or forty guinea fowl in single file, moving swiftly, running and walking, and all in absolute silence except for that one clink. How did he know they were there, and which way they would go? I know it all so promptly. There were questions I asked myself. We walked with the sun that, it, that is towards the west, 
so that the light would show up the game and be in their eyes, making it more difficult for them to see us. We watched the little red stimbuck get up from his form, shake the jewels from his coat, stretch himself and then pick his way daintily through the wet grass, nibbling here and there as he went. Rocky did not fire, he wanted something better. After the sun had risen, flooding the whole country of golden light, and while the dew lasted, making it glisten like a bespangled transformation scene, we came on a patch of old long grass, parted by some twenty yards, we walked through it abreast. There was a wild rush from under my feet. A yellowish body dashed through the grass, and I got out in time to see a rootbuck ram cantering away. Then Rocky, beside me, gave a shrillless whistle. The buck stopped, side on, looked back at us, and Rocky dropped it where it stood. Instantly following the shot, there was another rush on our left, and before the second rootbuck buck had gone thirty yards, Rocky toppled it over in its tracks. From the whistle to the second shot, it was all done in about ten seconds. To me, it looked like magic. I could only gasp. We cleaned the bucks and hid them in a bush. There was meat enough for the camp then, and I thought we would return at once for boys to carry it. But Rocky, a moment's glance around, shouldered his rifle and moved on again. I followed, asking no questions. We had been only gone a few minutes when, to my great astonishment, he stopped and, pointing straight in front, asked, What did you put up for that stump? I looked hard and answered confidently, Two hundred. Step it, was his reply. And my pace the distance was eighty-two yards. It was very bewildering. He helped me out a bit with bush telescopes, Sonny. You mean it magnifies them? I asked in surprise. No, it magnifies the distance like looking down an avenue. Gun barrels are miles long when you put your eye to it. Open a flat to bring them closer and cross water or gully seems like you can put your hand on them. I would have missed by feet that time, Rocky. You can take it for a start half the distance and aim low. Aim low as well. There's always something though. Legs and ground to show what you've done, but there's no outers marked down the sky. Once, as we walked along, he paused to look at some freshly overturned ground and dropped the, the one word, pig. We turned then to the right and presently came upon some blay ground densely covered with tall green reeds. He slowed down as we approached, I tiptoed in sympathy, and when, only a few yards off, he stopped and beckoned me on, and as I came abreast, he raised his hand in warning, soft of murmur, as many deep voices. It conveys no idea of the fact to say that they were grunts. They were softened out of all recognition. There is only one word for it. They sounded confidential. Then, as we listened, I could make out the soft, silky rustling of the rich undergrowth, and presently could follow by the quivering and waving of odd reeds the movements of the animals themselves. They were only a few yards from us, the nearest four or five they were busy and contented, but it was obvious they were utterly unconscious of our presence. As we peered down to the reeds from our greater height, it seemed that we could see the ground and that not so much as a rat could have passed unnoticed, yet we saw nothing. And then, without the slightest sign, cause or warning that I could detect, in one instant every sound ceased. I watched the reeds like a cat on the pounce. Never a stir or sign or sound. They had vanished. I turned to Rocky. He was standing at ease, and there was the faintest look of amusement in his eyes. They must be there. They, haven't, they can't have got away. It was a sort of indignant protest against his evident choking it, but it was full of doubt all the same. Try, he said, and I jumped into the reeds straight away. The under foliage, it is true, was thicker and deeper than it had looked, but for all that it was like a conjuring trick, they were not there. I waded through a hundred yards or more of the narrow bout. It was not more than twenty yards wide anywhere, but the place was deserted. It struck me then if they could do on just that ten, five to ten yards while we were watching them from the bank, and they did not know it. Well, I chucked it too. Rocky was standing in the same place with the same faint look of friendly amusement when I got back wet and muddy. Pigs is like that, he said. Same as elephants, just disappears. We went on again, and a quarter of an hour later, it may be Rocky stopped 
subsided to a sitting position, beckoned to me, and pointed with his levelled rifle in front. It was a couple of minutes before he could get me to see the stembuck standing in the shade of a thorn tree. I would have never seen it but for his whisper to look for something moving that gave it to me. I saw the movement of the high, high head as it cropped. High right, was Rocky's comment, as the bullet ripped the bark off a tree and startled Stembuck raced away. In the excitement, I had forgotten his advice already, but there was no time to feel sick and disgusted. The buck puzzled by the report on one side and the smash on the tree on the other half circled us and stopped to look back. Rocky laid his hand on my shoulder. Take your time, Sonny, he said. Aim low and don't pull. Squeeze. And at last, I got it. We had our breakfast there. The liver roasted on the coals and a couple of doughboys, with the unexpected addition of a bottle of cold tea, weak and unsweetened, produced from Rocky's knapsack. We stayed there a couple of hours, and that is the only time he really opened out. I understood then, at last, that of his deliberate kindliness, he had come out that morning, meaning to make a happy day of it for a youngster, and he did it. He had the knack of getting it at the heart of things, and put it all into the fewest words. He spoke in the same slow, grave way, with habitual economy of breath and words, and yet with the pictures yet the pictures were living and real, and each incident complete. I seemed to get from him that morning all there was to know of the hunting in two great continents grizzlies and other bar, moose and waipiti hunting in the snows of the northwest, elephant, buffalo, rhino, lions and schools more in the sweltering heat of Africa. That was a happy day. When I woke up next morning, Rocky was fitting the packs on his donkeys. I was a little puzzled, wondering at first if he was testing his saddles, for he had, no he had said nothing about moving on. But when he joined us at breakfast, the donkeys stood packed and ready to start. Then Robbie asked, Are you to make a move, Rocky? Yes, I reckon I'll get, he said, answered quietly. I ate in silence, thinking of what he was to face. Many hundreds of miles, perhaps a thousand or two. Many months, maybe a year or two, wild country, wild tribes and wild beasts, floods and fever, accident, hunger and disease, and alone. When we had finished breakfast, he rinsed out his beaker and hung it on one of the packs, slung his rifle over his shoulder, and picking up his long assegai wood, walking and stick-tapped stick -tapped the donkeys lightly to turn them into the Kaffir footpath that led away north. They jogged it on into the place in a single file. Rocky paused the second before following, turned one brief, grave glance on us, and said, Well, so long. He never came back.